start the afternoon session, please. Sorry for the slight delay in starting this session. We're just trying to put in place the arrangements for the rest of the afternoon. But we are now on the home stretch and we want to make sure we get the best value out of every minute that we have still together. And this session now is going to be a reporting back session on the workshops that ha were held this morning uh, in addition to two of the workshops from yesterday afternoon. So could I have the rapporteurs on stage please with me? Thank you. No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go. Mira is about to take her place. And if I could start from my left here, which is, is Bibi, and I, I, if each of you would just ref tell us what it is you're reporting back on. Bibi, over to you, please. And we, o we only have half an hour for this session, so I would uh, encourage people to be succinct and brief. Okay, it's on. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bibi Giose. I was the moderator for the session on nutrition in the SDGs. What does this mean for implementation and impact at country level? It is important to know that this session had all the five SUN networks represented. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, offer a vision for a fairer, more prosperous, peaceful, and sustainable world in which no one is left behind. The 2030 Agenda gives great energy and the guidance for reducing and eliminating hunger and malnutrition in all its forms. The question is, how do we actually do this and achieve this? The participants and the panelists deliberated at length on this issue. Several themes came up, but of importance is that one, country ownership is important. And things have to be done in a contextualized manner around the globally agreed goals. Countries need to develop that set of national goals, therefore. As we know, action doesn't necessarily always happen globally, but action has to happen on the ground. This is important also for monitoring and accountability. We have to be sure that everything we do is monitored, is tracked, and we are held accountable across different partners, across different sectors. Therefore, this means that no one sector can do it all. There is need to harmonize our actions as different players. And through the Sun Networks, I believe we have the opportunity to ensure that we provide optimum support to the member states and to the Sun countries. Going on to indicators. Indicators are important. If you don't have an indicator, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. It's as simple as that. But looking at the way the 
indicators in the SDGs are structured. I believe we need to go beyond the current two indicators articulated. So it is important to include the six World Health Assembly indicators and if not, go a little further. Because if they don't appear, it's an excuse not to invest in them. The maternal nutrition is missing from the agenda. So the indicators should include it. The opportunity here lies in the fact that within the next coming weeks, there is a meeting of the interagency group where the Sun Networks should or need to write letters to the chairs of this interagency expert group for the SDGs. So countries must also reach out in the next month to make sure that their voices are heard, to make sure that the indicators are fully embracive. We can't do this without money. Financing is important. So pulling resources from within governments, harnessing resources and ensuring that in terms of requests, countries do put forward requests to the donor communities because this request of financing from outside is normally demand driven. A couple of challenges which we can manage. We need to harmonize. We need to act together. We need to ensure that we track progress. We need to ensure that we resource the actions. And last but not least, we ensure that as the Sun Movement, we work in tandem, we amplify our actions on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bibi. Okay, we're next moving to, to Jakob, and Jak uh, Jakob, you were dealing with some, one of the uh, issues yesterday, I think. Yeah, over to you, please. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jakob Kakietek, and I was facilitating yesterday session 2A on a hard talk on costing of nutrition-sensitive uh, interventions and actions. And I was asked to talk about uh, one key achievement of the session, uh, one challenge, one next step, and one point of consensus, so a lot of ones. Um, so the one achievement that we identified during the session uh, was that uh, countries are already doing a lot of great work in developing cost estimates for nutrition sensitive actions that are included in their national plans. Um, and those happen either through the costing exercises of national nutrition plans or through um, cost estimates that are done for sectoral plans and sectoral uh, um, implementation platforms. And we uh, saw yesterday during the session a couple of very interesting examples, one from Mali where uh, a colleague presented uh, a way <coughs> costing was done for the National Nutrition Plan and a colleague from Bangladesh <coughs> who showed us some costing done for the country investment plan as an example of uh, a broader sectoral approach to costing of nutrition sensitive interventions. One key challenge that I think we have identified, and this is not a new challenge, this is a challenge that we have been talking about for, uh, for uh, some time now, is that uh, there was a lack of clarity of what nutrition sensitive interventions really are. And specifically, uh, in order to answer the question which actions should be costed as nutrition sensitive approaches to nutrition, is that which actions should be considered to be nutrition sensitive and included in the national plan. And here I think the key gap is uh, the uh, scarcity of evidence. In order to identify nutrition sensitive actions, we need to know which actions in sectors of agriculture, education, social protection, water, etc., uh, have impact on nutrition outcomes that are at the center of our work. And I think this is particularly important given that the uh, Sun 2.0 is all about impact and results. <coughs> and we cannot achieve results and impacts without identifying impactful actions. Um, the good news here is that the evidence exists. Uh, there is a lot of work that's a, that is being done. We know what works in the health sector. I think there's also a lot of good work that different colleagues in different organizations do in agriculture, in WASH, uh, in social protection, in education. So we know, in fact, more than we know, in fact, more that we know what we know. It's really complicated, but we know more than we think. Um, 
so the question is now, how can we bring all this knowledge together? And this is one of the clear next steps that emerged from that session, is that uh, there was a very, very clear demand, which was particularly strong coming from the colleagues who work in countries, from, from our colleagues in the government and uh, governmental agencies that, uh, that handle nutrition. Um, is that we need a summary or guidance of nutrition sensitive actions in different sectors. Um, and I think there is a very clear role for the Sun Secretariat to be one of the conveners of this action. There is also clear, clear roles for, uh, for other organizations, all of us in this room. Uh, but uh, there needs to be an effort to uh, synthesize the knowledge uh, that we have right now and provide guidance on what key approaches and key sectors are that have uh, impact on nutrition. And finally, there was one clear point of consensus that's related specifically to the, to the costing of nutrition uh, sensitive approaches and interventions. Um, one was uh, that there is a temptation to cost uh, actions in different sectors and then include those costs into the cost estimates of nutrition of the National Nutrition Plan. However, what we have agreed on is that what really needs to happen is that we need to identify how much it costs to make the actions that are already implemented in the different sectors uh, to make them nutrition sensitive. So we don't need to cost uh, everything. We just need to focus on those aspects of actions that are already uh, happening, that are already being implemented, that make those actions nutrition sensitive. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Jakob. We're now going directly on to Milo, please. Thank you. Um, I was asked to report on session 3F, which was on advocacy planning. And this was not a typical um, session because it was based on building some skills, so it's really more like a, a mini workshop. And the, the session focused on the basics of developing an advocacy strategy, goals, objectives, tactics, and messages. And I need to say that um, the developing and building advocacy skills has been a, re a long-standing request from um, civil service uh, organizations through the alliances and coming through the civil society network. And uh, so here it was an attempt to begin to deliver on that um, in some way. Um, I must say though that um, the uh, participants found this to be an extremely helpful session. Uh, it was only an hour, but uh, people felt that they walked away with specific skills. They got to, to practice those skills. They got feedback on them in small groups and uh, they, they felt they were taking something back home and they clearly wanted more of this. So I, I do have some key messages um, uh, that came from the facilitators and also from the participants themselves. And uh, the first one is that all of us, in a way, are advocates, and we've heard that before. We're all advocates here because we're all part of this movement. And we all do advocacy in an ad hoc manner in, in many ways. But in order to be um, effective, especially trying to accomplish these you know, big goals that we have, Advocacy needs to be planned and needs to be properly resourced. Um, so that's one key message. Um, uh, the other is that um, goals, of course, need to be specific. The more specific, um, the better, the, the easier it is to be able to, um, to obtain them. Objectives, of course, need to be smart. Messages need to be developed for specific audiences. Um, the, uh, the other message is that um, the, some of the key elements in terms of, um, of an advocacy strategy include um, increasing awareness. And this is you know, very general. I mean, we're just kind of skimming the surface of what, what this is all about. But increasing awareness of different actors uh, regarding the causes and the consequences of chronic infant malnutrition. Um, also, uh, obtaining political commitment and, if need be, obtaining political commitment at the highest level. Um, and being able to deliver messages um, in an easy and easy to understand way um, that are tailored to different audiences. Um, advocacy is also about uh, taking advantage of opportunities, uh, being at the right place, the right time, with a particular key actor, and being able to deliver that message. 
But, you know, the spontaneity is, is great, and that's part of the advocacy work, but it works best within a, a structure of a plan. Um, so being spontaneous is good, and we all do it all the time, but the, having a plan is, is really critical. The other is a, is a message to, uh, to donors that uh, advocacy, of course, needs to be resourced and planned, and we need to have results frameworks and all that. But they also need to be aware that advocacy projects um, are not like regular development projects, and they need to take into account flexibility for that spontaneity and taking advantage of opportunities. So they should be um, more flexible in terms of um, dealing with um, organizations that are implementing these projects. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I'm conscious that Mira is under particular time pressure, so maybe would you like to go next? Thank you, Tom. That's very kind of you. Um, so I was asked to, usually I've, I'm supposed to come last because money comes at the very end. Uh, I was asked to, um, to facilitate the session on resource mobilization. Um, and, and we had a very, very interesting conversation. I won't go through the details, but, but just to summarize the one big um, consensus that emerged was that we need to make smart choices in the way we invest the money that we have so that we set into motion a virtuous cycle between more nutrition for the money that we have and that will lead to success in terms of more money for nutrition in the future. And we heard from uh, two countries that have actually set that virtue, uh, actually several countries that have set that uh, virtue cycle into motion. Um, Madagascar is one of them. They, they were very successful in the early phases of, uh, uh, of the Sekalin project, and now they're building on that uh, success to go further, uh, to mobilize more resources. Ethiopia, similarly, very successful in the uh, uh, in the investments that they've made up to now um, and have achieved some results and are now mobilizing more resources to support a homegrown program, the Sekota uh, Declaration, and, and trying to garner the donors around that uh, um, uh, declaration. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is developing a a national plan, uh, very ambitious uh, resource requirements, but also recognizing that within that they will prioritize to, uh, to invest in the uh, interventions that give them the maximum bang for their buck, the maximum number of stunted children uh, prevented based on the uh, resources that might become available. Um, where we had, um, uh, some, we also had interesting conversations that you can generate resources, or you need to generate resources primarily from domestic uh, financing, from ODA, from the private sector, and then also from innovative financing. Uh, very interesting to note that on the domestic financing side, there is a very, very wide range. There are some countries that are investing a few cents per child, and then there are other countries, Guatemala being at the extreme end, that is investing almost $25 per child. Per. And given that investment, we don't see the results in some of those countries, but we see some results in other countries where even small cents are invested. And that is a classic example of how smart investing can, can get us the results that we are uh, looking for. Um, so in the countries that are at, at the higher end of investment, we want to work with them to make their investments smarter. In the countries where only a few cents are being invested at the moment, we need to work with them to generate more resources for um, those countries. On the challenge side, um, innovative financing is, is a very sexy word. Everybody likes the idea. Um, but we all seem to think that somehow innovative financing will come from somewhere outside. Indonesia showed us through their presentation that actually they've generated innovative financing from within Indonesia, within the domestic budget, f for uh, um, action at uh, village level. 
through a new law, uh, the village law, and, and block grants for villages, and then linking those resources with results on the ground. I think that is a very interesting innovative financing mechanism uh, that Indonesia shared with us. Um, I, I want to take 30 seconds to ask people, how many people in this room have heard, uh, raise your hands if you've heard of the Global Financing Facility? Thank you. More than half the room has never heard of GFF. It is an innovative financing facility that is available and open to most of the countries in this room. We need to be, the challenge is we as nutrition community are never at the table when some of these uh, financing facilities are being discussed. Kenya has been very successful in including nutrition uh, in the uh, GFF. Uh, the global financing facility in developing the investment plan for that. Tanzania has done it. Um, other countries are in the process of doing it. And I want to uh, stop at that point and encourage any country that is here Go, when you go home, the first thing you want to do uh, uh, is to talk to your Ministry of Health and ask, are we a GFF country and why are we not including nutrition in there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira. And if you need to leave, obviously, off you go. Thanks very much indeed. Jane, please. So I'm giving feedback on the use of information and evidence in policy making for nutrition, platforms and processes. We had a very lively discussion and we had many countries represented, so the discussion was very valuable. On the point of a progress or achievement, the very fact that we are discussing the role of science at this meeting is in itself progress. Uh, because the information and data that science generates is definitely necessary. And as sun countries want to scale up, they are going to need science in that process. So if we take a look at some of the challenges and bottlenecks, the first that we see was that there is great variability across the countries in terms of the platforms where scientists and policymakers interact. From formal and structured, through existing but fragmented or not organized or recognized, to non-existent. And that in itself is a problem. Secondly, it was clear that there's a disconnect between scientists and policy makers. And so the voice has been heard that we have heard many times during the sessions. Also, that this is not always as a result of a lack of data, but either a channel to communicate it or poor translation of the science to the policy makers. In fact, someone in the session said, the science ends up in publications, not in the hands of policy makers. It was also recognized that that science needs to be transformed to be useful and of value to policy makers, as well as being timely. There was recognition of the need for briefs, infographics, and then, very importantly, always to link it to a costing, because the policy makers want to be able to say to the end of the table, this is how much it's going to need. And there was a recognition that there's often not the capacity to be able to do that and do that translation and transformation. There was also a recognition of the need for the convergence of the research community. And by that, they meant the research community across sectors. So not only within nutrition, but within agriculture, within social development. And to have a network where these could come together to respond to queries received, to provide country-specific data, because global data was recognized as good, but what shifts the needle is local data and then to be able to discuss, share, and even set the research agenda. It really was brought up that countries need to be able to do more determining of the research agenda themselves than to have it forced upon them by the outside. 
There was also discussion around the need to have greater engagement with civil society and science because civil society can actually push the information generated by science to the policy makers and hold everybody accountable. So they should not be neglected. There was also a clear need to link the scientific research with implementation and the actual operationalizing of the research findings into something that can be done and scaled up. So in conclusion, the one next step that came up was that it is critical that the right information from the science is available to the right people at the right time and in a format that policymakers can understand and act on. So that means from this group that science is needed, it needs to be at the table, and we need to ensure that science has a formal home, which it currently doesn't have, within Sun in each country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. So, final speaker uh, is, is Mina, please. Thank you. Um, I was the rapporteur for the session on innovations in social and behaviour change, communication for nutrition. Um, the moderators were Anne Jimison from Alive and Thrive and Marty Van Leer from Gain. Um, it was a different kind of session, it was very interactive and we began by understanding that we don't always practice the behaviour we know is best for us. Uh, we did an exercise as a group where we first validated that we know that regular physical exercise is good for our health and then we all admitted to how much of that we actually do. Uh, and it wasn't much for some of us. Um, the, the main message that came out of the session for all of us was that behaviour change is more than the rational and logical, and it's more often <coughs> driven by emotions. And from that, our work in behaviour change must be based on research about the emotional drivers of behaviour. And we got that from examples from Myanmar, Vietnam, the Kyrgyz Republic, Uganda and Malawi, um, where they looked at early initiation of breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding and mic micronutrient sprinkles. Um, and those four countries, five countries, demonstrated to us the behaviour change campaigns they've developed and how successful they were in changing those relevant behaviours. Um, from those examples, we got three key messages. Um, the first one was, well it links to your, your comments, was around using evidence-based processes and not just launching into behaviour change campaigns or programming without the necessary research to inform us. Um, and that needs uh, investment um, and planning for investment. The second one was use data to choose the priority behaviour we want to change. And the third one was to use data to identify the drivers of behaviour and that's both the rational and the emotional drivers. In re relation to next steps, there was one key next step that we drew out, um, and that is to understand better what countries need to take behaviour change campaigns to scale. Um, and specifically for the Sun Movement Secretariat, um, they commented that they're keen to understand how better to support countries with their behaviour change campaigns. And there was a request that we approached them about that. I think. Um, just a final note, and it was more a personal reflection. Um, I think this year and last year at the Global Gathering, we've talked a lot about gender equality and women's empowerment, and it's been such an important part of the conversation, and at least I have often felt very challenged on how we take that to the next step, and I think that was one of the evaluation findings as well. Um, you know, moving from rhetoric to practice, and, and the the session I was in, it came through very strongly. When we looked at the behaviour change campaigns and materials that were shown to us by those countries, gender equality and women's empowerment was addressed, I think, in all of them in different ways and very meaningfully. They weren't all... A, they, those campaigns were not about achieving gender equality, but they mainstreamed those issues within them in a meaningful way and in a way that didn't um, detract from the impact of the campaigns themselves. And it, uh, in particular, we were focused on uh, infant and young child feeding. And it also reminded me of what one of the panellists yesterday said. Um, 
which is women are strong but vulnerable and it's about how we draw out those strengths of women and support them to be strong. And those behaviour change examples um, did that very, very well and put women at the centre and recognised their reality. So I think that was a really important message that came out of the session. Thank you very much, Mina. And I think we've managed to get through that reporting within the half hour that we had allocated uh, to it. So thank you all uh, for that. Just to put the, the, that reporting back in context, just to remind you all that, again that these discussions, that they all relate to priorities in the Sun communities of practice work, uh, the work that's been going on for quite some time now. And in early November, we'll be launching an online discussion forum to continue these important uh, discussions. And we'll be work in this, we'll be working together with the Emergency Nutrition Network, ENN. Uh, so this will be an opportunity to, to continue sharing and learning following this global gathering. So I think we've made a real effort here to have good reporting, but it's all been captured and we'll, we'll be tr integrating that into uh, our work into the future. So thank you all. Now, I want to move towards the, the last, uh, the last uh, substantive group session which will be taking place from three o'clock. And for this, I'm going to ask Florence. Thank you, well done. Uh, I'm going to ask Florence to come up and make a brief introduction to it. Thank you, Tom. So you will go back into groups. Uh, there will be a slide coming in a minute that will tell you in which room you will go. Um, we've organized in a way that we mix everything. So you don't stay in group per country or per network, it's per alphabetical order. Um, you will be in five different rooms and each room will be animated, facilitated by two members of the executive committee of the Sun Movement. Because they need to hear from you uh, so that they are able to develop the, um, the roadmap. Here we are. So, in, Amber, in room number one and two, that is on this side, the first one. I think you are getting used to the room now. Um, all people from Abakirova to Cousins, plus our colleagues uh, speaking Russian. They are the only one who can stay as a group because they need their translator. Um, and they will have, sorry, Martin Blum and Aslam Shahin will be their co-facilitators. In Amber Room 3-4, from Copli Boni to Imran, and you will have Francesco Branca and Daisy De Marques as your co-facilitators. In Amber Room 5-6, from Indrayana to Matindi, uh, you will be co-facilitated by Foco Vinces and Felix Firi. In Amber Room 7-8, Everybody from Machi to Rajuela, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, you will be facilitated by Abdoulaika and Uma Koirala. The last group from Rajuelina to Zotor uh, will go in brown room one and will be co facilitated by William Shilufia and Christine Kintu. The focus will be again on the four questions that uh, Tom has highlighted several times uh, since we are together and that you had received before coming here. Uh, your ambition, thank you, your ambition uh, for the future of, the, of, the, of nutrition in your countries, um, how will you or your organization contribute to the achievement of the Sun Movement? Um, what do you or your organization need from others in the Sun Movement to make your contribution more effective? And how will your contribution be measured and accounted for? I know that some of you, um, especially the government people, went through those four questions already as a group, as government, uh, on Tuesday afternoon. 
It's again the same questions, but it's a multi-stakeholder discussion uh, this afternoon, and it facilitated by the um, executive committee members. You will all come back here at five. You, you will have one rapporteur per room who will tell us not everything, but a little bit about your conversation, and then we will have our final uh, panel at five here. You can take half an hour for a coffee break, but if you want to talk until five, up to you. At five, we sharp, we start our plenary, our last plenary of our little journey together. Thank you. Okay, so I would just re-emphasize that we would like to start the final plenary on time. Uh, we will, will have another, an important person joining us for that who hasn't been able to be with us for the rest of the, uh, of the meeting. It's uh, Erthren Cousin, who is the executive director of the World Food Programme, and we very much look forward uh, to, to hearing from Erthren and the other people who will be reporting back on the discussions you are now about to have. So, good talking, and we'll see you at five.
Stunting is a problem which is caused by malnutrition, but it is a problem which can be solved. So pano di funu kuti ansu zol si kuno kumalawi. Agudziwa programs zimenewa. One thousand special days. Tieni ti kujitza kuto lo puti nimbira. Eh koma chichewa is difficult for us. Eh mama koma pepani azungu akuzungu lira mutu. Eh koma tieni ti kujitza kuto lo puti nimbira. Zikomoni. Daddy, put it.